that instantiates the circuit. So now you have a real circuit. So, so now you have a real circuit, run from left to right. Um, and we say the circuit is hard distributed with respect to that architecture. If every one of the local gates is drawn independently from um, the space of uniform unit, uniformly from the space of unitary, so from Haar measure. And then like any other quantum computation task, you start from all zeros state, you run the circuit, you make measurements and you interpret the results. The claim has been that classically sampling, so coming up with a classical algorithm that efficiently gives you samples from a distribution, just like the distribution of this quantum circuit is hard. That is classically sampling from the output distribution is hard. So the conjecture is that there's no classical randomized algorithm that performs random circuit sampling, RCS efficiently. But for quantum complexity theoretical reasons that I could get into, but I probably won't get into, it's sufficient to show that this quantity, which is a probability amplitude of starting from all zero state, running the circuit and measuring the probability amplitude on all zero states is sharpie hard. And sharpie hard means really hard. Like it includes NP hard. It's like a counting version of NP hard. NP hard says, does there exist a satisfying assignment? Sharpie hard says, how many satisfying assignments? So if it's zero, is unsatisfiable, but if the answer is one, two, three, etc., it's satisfiable. But you know, Sharpie Hart demands that number, like how many? So this actually turns out that this point, this probability amplitude, is not sufficient to prove the quantum supremacy conjecture. You have to prove that this point and some neighborhood of it, some epsilon neighborhood of it, where epsilon is a very particular number that I'm intentionally not telling you right now, because I don't want the beginning of the talk to have too many numbers in it and symbols. But there's some specific neighborhood of P0 of C that you're supposed to show everything in this pink region is hard. Actually, it's sharply hard. When the, random, when the gates of the quantum computer are random. Can I ask okay? you a question, Rami? So it's of just this one amplitude you're saying is enough to prove uh, the approximate sampling hardness of the entire That's thing? Right. That's right. So there's a there's a quantity called hiding, which says um, you could consider any other amplitude, but the answer is going to be the same. So the, exactly, there's some there's this, and also another thing is that we talked about sampling, but now I'm talking about quantifying a particular number, and the equivalence of those two are not, you know, clear immediately. But there's a stock wave reduction that says if you could sample efficiently then you can calculate this quantity accurately. And the contrapositive is that if this quantity is hard, then sampling is hard. So that's why you can focus on this quantity. Because normally I would have thought that a, you know, a single amplitude being hard is difficult for exact sampling. But, exactly. uh, but in this case, because it's, this, because it's a random circuit, because of that, it's actually enough for approximate. Is it kind of like that? Or? Yeah, so, so the actual argument goes like this. If sampling were easy, you could do this to plus minus epsilon. If you can come up with a proof saying that this cannot be done efficiently for any classical algorithm, even approximately, then sampling must be hard. And by sampling, we mean you come up with a classical algorithm that takes as input the description of the circuit and gives you strings according to a probability distribution that's very close to the probability distribution that is induced by the circuit. Because the circuit, you can just run, right? In milliseconds, you get, you get, you draw from its distribution by measuring. But uh, the classical brute force is gonna be very slow as we all know. Uh, but the point is that you will not have any clever classical algorithm that will produce samples from a distribution that's even close. And if that, were, if that were easy, then you could calculate this quantity easily by stock my reduction. That's why we focus on this quantity, okay? Does that answer your question, Alexey? Good. Yes, thank you. All right, so today we're gonna do that. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna prove to you that this point is hard and I'll prove to you that a neighborhood, epsilon neighborhood of it is hard, but that epsilon I can prove is slightly shorter than what you would need to prove the quantum supremacy conjecture, which has been open for over a decade now, all right? But I wanna um, 
yeah, so we will prove that in this whole Magenda region, uh, everything is sharply hard. And it is, uh, you will see that this proof is in some ways first of its kind. And we'll talk, we'll talk about the details of it. So I wanna, I wanna tell you a little bit about how this might work. So uh, the idea is that there exists some circuit that some famous person, say like Terhal de Vincenzo circuit 2004 or the IQP circuits, which are naturally connected to Ising models, there is some known deterministic circuit. You can publish its gates, the numbers, you know, it's Z's, control Z's, et cetera. We call it the worst case circuit for which somebody came and proved that this quantity is indeed sharply hard to some multiplicative, to some approximation. So they proved that this is hard. Um, the idea now is that suppose you take that circuit with that particular architecture and you ask, is it hard on average? That is, instead of grabbing those particular um, local gates, you take average case gates. That is, you take random gates. You take gates independently and identically distributed from HAR measure. So the, the, the way this reduction is gonna work is that you, you have something that is known to be hard in the worst case. You deform the circuit in a way that I haven't told you how, with the hope that that will parameterize this circuit and therefore the probability in a way that we can make an argument and say that, you know, at theta equals one, it coincides with the circuit, which is known to be sharply hard. And at theta equals zero, it corresponds to an average case circuit, so a random circuit, remember, with, that, with the same architecture, but from hard distribution. And, and in a way, then, we can, we can relate the complexity theoretical um, basis of the two. So we'll relate the complexity of the worst case to the average case, which I'll, which I'll explain in a second. And it's important that we, we do the deformation locally, that is, like, we respect the architecture. So if this is the worst case circuit, the, the, the theta deformation I told you about is such that at theta equals zero, you have R, and at theta equals one, you recover the actual circuit. Now, how can such a thing work? Well, I'm gonna explain to you an idea of a reduction from computer science. I know most of you are physicists. Reductions are very powerful in computer science. And so you can reduce the complexity of the worst case to average case in the following sense. So suppose we did make a parameterization P0 of theta. I haven't told you whether it's even possible, whether we can do it. That's the subject of this talk to some extent. But suppose we have, for the sake of argument, because I want to explain reductions to you. Suppose we have deformed the circuit in such a way that we did that theta deformation respecting the architecture such that P0 of theta becomes a polynomial of low degree in theta. Suppose it does happen. And by construction at theta equals one, it's the solution to a sharply hard problem. And at theta equals zero, okay. And at theta equals zero or very near zero, it corresponds to circuits whose local gates are from the Haar measure. So the average case circuit or random circuit. And this delta, capital delta is little o of one, which means it's like vanishing. So these are, these are all points in here. You can think of them for all practical purposes to have thetas that are very close to zero, if not zero. Now, if it so happens- question, be... Sorry, Ravis, can I yeah, ask another question? Yeah, so yeah, how, sure. can, how can you, I mean, like a single theta, I mean, you need like another pr parameterization, right? To, to like parameterize all random circuits. So somehow a C of zero is not one circuit, but somehow like many circuits, right? Or something like that. Um, like how, um, or like there are different C of zeros, right? because you want to parameterize like a hard random. Right, so the way the experiment works is that, so I'm gonna give an answer. If you feel like this is not the answer to your question, ask again, okay? So the way these circuit, the experiments work is that you have say your 100 gates that are known to be in the worst case hard, okay? Then you generate 100 gates, corresponding gates with the same size from the hard measure once and you fix them, you publish them. Then you run the task on that particular realization of the Haar circuit, okay? So that would correspond to a fixed matrix drawn from the Haar measure. And then maybe you do this 10 times for 10 different realizations on average. But the thing is that every time you run the circuit, you fix the local gates. 
the worst case is given to you, but the average case is drawn once. I see. So it is, it is actually one, like C of zero is one, is one. is one realization. Okay, okay, okay. And C of near zero is something very close to it. Exactly. That's a good question. So now this is the, this is the very nifty, I really love this idea. It's very simple. Um, so assume, assume that there exists a classical algor efficient algorithm O, computer scientists like O because it's an oracle that calculates P0 of theta in this blue box. That is like, it can't, you give it the description of the average case circuit, it'll give you P0 of theta. Suppose, suppose there was such a thing. Some clever algorithm we haven't discovered. Well, then I can call O D plus one times because the degree of the polynomial is D. So any degree D polynomial is A0 plus A1 theta plus A2 theta squared plus da, 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 A sub D theta to the power of D. So if I have D plus one theta I's and the Oracle, the O gives me P of theta I's, I have a linear system of size D plus one. Then linear systems are easy to solve. They're polynomial time solvable. So I can solve for the coefficients that write down P zero of theta exactly and efficiently. Well, if I have written down P0 of theta exactly, I just plug in theta equals one. And that will give me the solution of a Sharpie hard problem. But my assumption was that this classical algorithm was polynomial time efficient. These steps were efficient. So I ended up solving something that is supposed to be not efficient, efficiently. And that's a contradiction. That is, if all these steps were efficient, there is no way um, I would have been able to, you know, solve a Sharpie hard problem unless P equals sharp P hard, sharp P. But we don't believe P equals sharp P. We actually don't even believe P is equal to MP and sharp P is larger than MP. So that's a contradiction, assuming complexity theory is sane, right? That polynomial hierarchy doesn't collapse and you know, stuff like that. So what can you conclude? Well, the linear system is easy to solve. Um, the only thing that you have to conclude is that there cannot be a classical algorithm that efficiently calculates all these points. Some of these points must have been hard. Can, can I ask another question? So this assumption yeah, sure. that it's a polynomial of low degree, where did that come from? Okay, so I haven't told you yet. Ah, okay. I, said, I said, just take my word that to, to explain the polynomial. And it turns out that the polynomials won't work. I'll need the low degree algebraic functions as you will see. But just to explain how the reduction works, this is the simplest way I could do it, okay? It's not a priori clear whether you can parameterize the circuits to get a polynomial. Okay. So the idea is that you grab every one of the gates, and this is basically summarizing what I've been telling you. You grab every one of the gates, so N, capital N here is two or four, like, you know, a one qubit or two qubit gate, and you theta the format in such a way that it's zero, so at one, it's the known Sharpie hard instance, and at zero, it's hard measure. And just remember that, like, if H sub K is the corresponding hard gate that we just discussed, you know, you just go generate a hard gate, anything times hard is hard. That's just translation invariance of the hard measure by definition of hard measure. So at theta equals zero, we have something that is hard, because it's random. So now it goes back to this question that you were saying. It cannot be, can we get a low degree polynomial? How would you do such a parameterization, right? Now, how can we do such a thing? So one result, speaking of uh, Bill, who just came up, so is due to my colleagues, Bulan, uh, Thufferman, Nirke, and Vazirani. So the, you know, the most obvious thing you could do is to write down a geodesic. I mean, if you, you don't need to know what a geodesic. It just means that the minimal path between these two points is that you graph CK, multiply by HK, and you multiply it by e to the minus I theta HK. Now, let me close this. There's somebody mowing the grass. And if you did this by construction, it's made such that at theta, first of all, at theta equals zero, do you agree this is identity? So you have CK times HK, which is random har. And at theta equals one, you have e to the minus i little h sub k. And e to the minus i little h sub k is, is by definition h capital HK dagger. 
That's what defines the little HK. So it implements the inverse of HK. So you just get CK, which is CK of one. So the two required, the two endpoints are okay. But the issue is that the exponential function, and I'll drill down on this on the next slide, exponential function is not a polynomial. It's an exponential. And so, well, how can you turn it into a polynomial? Because we want every one of the gates to look to be a polynomial in theta, then their products will be a polynomial. So how can you make it a polynomial? Well, uh, what they did is that they Taylor expand and they chop it off. So a surgical approach, you know, you Taylor expand the infinite series and after, you know, polynomial in many terms, just chop it off and throw it out. And the result of doing this is that you have a unitary times a unitary times something that is not unitary anymore. If I truncate, it's not unitary anymore because I would have to keep all the tests for it to be unitary. So the corresponding gate shown with the tilde leaves the unitary group, the two by two or four by four unitary group, but it gives you a polynomial. So then you have to do, so then they folk, so this was the actual circuit. We can't do this. So you truncate it and you have a non-unitary circuit as a result. Every one of the gates is non-unitary. Their product is a non-unitary. Previous picture. So um, recall that e to the minus i little h sub k by definition of little h sub k is hk dagger. So, and hk is some permission. So the path we were hoping to do is this, ck times, this h is from Haar measure, hk e to the minus i theta hk, which at one is indeed ck, and at zero is something from Haar. We can't do that. So because this is not a polynomial, we Taylor expand up to the Lth order. In their paper, they, they, use a, they use capital K. I didn't want to use too many Ks. They do to Lth order, and you chop it off instead of going to infinity. And that gives you CK theta tilde, which is non-unitary. And therefore, the whole circuit is non-unitary. Does that make sense? The non-unitarity, everything? Good. Thank you. Thank you. So what we had hoped to prove was that this point is hard and some epsilon neighborhood. And this epsilon I'm specifying now is two to the minus n over poly n. In the initial slide, I didn't tell you what the value was because I didn't want to include too many, you know, n's and stuff. Um, the reason there's a two to the minus n is that we have two to the n amplitudes. Each one is in expectation the same. So there's one over two to the n, the probability for any string. And you want to be able to tell a string from a string within a one over poly n. So there's some bumps over this uniform distribution that you should be able to decipher. Anyway, that's what, you, what is required for quantum supremacy. So what they prove is that my colleagues uh, Boulan et al. show that a circuit nearby that is not unitary, but you know you can make it close to unitary by chopping off after many terms. So they prove the hardness of this point. And with respect to, um, if you assume you have a classical, yeah, so they prove the hardness of this point, then they make a claim about a little bit of robustness, epsilon prime of e to the minus poly n. So some small bit of uh, epsilon they can prove, but the, the proof of the robustness is a little unnatural in that you have to assume Remember the reduction I showed you that you assume there's a classical algorithm, the red O, that takes in a circuit and gives you the probability near zero for the reduction to work? It would have to assume that that O doesn't take in a circuit, but actually takes in a non-unitary version of the circuit. So it, it has a different complexity theoretical assumption. So it, it doesn't take in. So if you give it a real circuit, it won't work. But if you give it the particular truncated circuit they have in mind, that's how they set up the uh, complexity argument. So it's with respect to a non-unitary oracle. And that is fine, but as long as you can prove that things will not go bad if you give it a real circuit. Suppose you give that oracle a real circuit, then you have to justify that things you know, won't change much. So this point won't change, but I could prove in my paper that then you cannot make a claim with respect to robustness. And actually, regardless of how well you want to approximate this point, it'll always blow up. And I'll, um, 
explain that more, you can also read Appendix A of this paper by Knapp, Harrow, Brandau, Denzel, there may be one other name that I'm forgetting, um, but there was a recent, Knapp was my student at the time, so it's a 2020 paper. And this Appendix A also gives a more sophisticated argument of what I did in my paper to show that actually not only uh, there's an exponential blow, it will never work in terms of robustness, in terms of epsilon. So let me tell you why that's the case. Um, the, the way you can prove, remember there was an O here that gives you a polynomial structure. But what you want to show is that if there is a little bit of epsilon, so each P of theta is P of theta plus minus some error, epsilon I. So you, know, you cannot expect your circuit to do things perfectly. It'll give you with some, some little error. So instead of getting the brown curve, you know, you evaluate some D plus one points and you get the yellow curve here. Then you want to show that the reduction still works. So when you extrapolate to the point one, it better be still sharply hard because then you can conclude that these points were hard, even in the approximate sense. If you recall my reduction idea that I showed you. The good thing is that this whole interval here Uh, is known to be hard. So there was some results showing that not just this point is sharply hard, but some neighborhood of it is sharply hard. So if you make a little bit of error, everything's fine, as long as you end up in this neighborhood. Now, the reason something goes wrong is the following. Um, the, there's something called the Pituri lemma that is used since boson sampling. So if you have a polynomial P of theta, so suppose this is the P of theta ideal, this is P of theta that's close to it with some error. The difference is still a polynomial. So if you have a P of theta that's degree D, this is just a lemma general, has nothing to do with circuits. And you know that P of theta is, is at most epsilon near zero for theta between zero and delta. So for suppose capital delta is very small and suppose P of theta is bounded to be a small function near zero. Then you ask, well, you know, that little bit of epsilon, how does that affect my extrapolation to the point one? What ends up happening is that there is a blow up with respect to the degree. So it'll be little epsilon times e to the two times degree of the polynomial times one plus one over delta. And remember this one over delta is itself a poly n in our analysis. Maybe I should pause here. Is there any questions so far? Uh, I, I see some question from Abhinav. Uh, okay, sorry, I don't see that. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I think I think Abhinav. Yeah, I, I asked him something privately to not confuse everyone, and he mistakenly responded to me publicly. So I don't think it's a question. Okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. But maybe I can I can I can maybe ask my question again. So like I would have thought that. Yeah. Um, so you're focusing essentially on this one amplitude. I sort of already asked that. Um, but like, if you want to prove a approximate sampling hardness, and, I, and I'm sure it's all right, it's my confusion. Um, no, no, like, it's fine. Wouldn't you, if it's exponentially small, like you can just throw out that amplitude, no? Uh, and uh, right. like, it doesn't matter whether it's hard or easy to compute. If the other ones are easy to compute, then you're kind of screwed. So, uh, but it's this hiding trick, right? That- uh, It's the hiding, yes. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. It's the hiding that says, you know, you can, it's sufficient to look, so look, you can, suppose you want to look at the probability of Y, C, and zero. Yeah. All you have to do is you add some poly X's at the end of your circuit. It right. changes the zero to whatever string you want, Y. And that's easy to do. You just need that most N flips, right? And it turns out that because of what you said, the hiding, you can, it's sufficient to prove that this one is hard, that that already shows the hardness of whatever you need. Cool. Okay. okay. It is the hiding property indeed. Any other questions? So let me tell you what goes wrong if you use non-unitarity as far as robustness is concerned. Um, so in this nice paper, which was actually my starting point, uh, Bouland et al, the nature physics paper. So if you make a truncation, you automatically, so suppose, okay, let me read backtrack. So instead of using, so in that box here, remember there was an O that calculates things. Suppose there's a real O. So this is actually a real algorithm that you give it 
description of a circuit, which by definition is unitary, and it gives you something. If this O is unitary, it's the same, you know, algorithm. Then by truncation, so this is just rewriting Paturi's lemma. And if you make it truncation, you will introduce this much error when you pass the description of the circuit into the algorithm. Because if you want something unitary, you give it a Taylor series chopped off version. M is the number of gates. N is the number of qubits. L is the degree of the truncation. And you see at this level, so they were right. They, they thought it shouldn't matter. And it, you know, it's understandable because, you know, by making L say, you know, MN squared, then you can just kill this, right? You can make it exponentially small, as small as you like. So this error can, you know, be taken, you know, arbitrarily low. And then you have this degree blow up. You just make sure that this exponent dominates this and crushing it. So these two points remain close so that the reduction works. That is, you, you want to make sure that you end up in this region, right? So you, for, the, for that to happen, these polynomials should be very small so that the blow up is not too bad. Sorry, but I mean, the issue, yep, go ahead. There was, there was interruptions. May I repeat those definitions from the, from the, the bottom of the, of the slide? Just, I, 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 personally, I didn't hear what is M, what is M. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. Thanks for interrupting and asking. So I was saying that if you make a truncation of the unitary circuit, you introduce, or, and suppose that O that I told you, the algorithm O, takes as an input, it's a real algorithm, it takes as an input a unitary description of a circuit. So some general purpose algorithm. Then by chopping off the Taylor series, you will introduce this much error. And it's easy to see. I mean, it's even in their paper. It's not, it's nothing original. It's just that, you know, the circuits will be a little distant. M is the number of gates. Mary is the number of gates. N, like Nancy, is the number of qubits. And L, capital L, is the degree of the truncation. Okay, Olas, you got it? Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, good. So by making L large enough, you could, in principle, make this arbitrarily small and everything is fine. That is, you would end up in this, in this close enough here that you would extrapolate to this region. Um, and that's why they did it. But what they didn't realize is that this L and D are not independent. The degree of the polynomial is a function of the point at which it truncates. So L, if every one of the gates is truncated, so this is actually very easy to see. I'm gonna explain it to you. L is the degree of truncation. So every one of the gates is going to be L. There are N total gates, and you multiply these polynomials, you get LM, because the degrees add. And the two in here comes from the fact that you don't care about just the entries of the circuit, you take the absolute value square to get the, po to get the probability, okay? So the degree is two times LM. And everything else comes from the definition of two. And if you factor an L, you will see that you have an e to the m and plus I factored out an L between here and here. And regardless of what you do, regardless of how large you make L, this factor always blows up. Um, so the only way it could not blow up is if you make this L exponentially large such that this whole thing becomes very negative. If I made L e to the four m del inverse, well, then I can overtake this, but that would mean that the degree of truncation has to be exponentially large, right? And that kind of defeats the purpose because then the polynomials are not of low degree, they're exponential degree. If they're exponential degree, the linear solver that I had uh, in my reduction, the linear solver would have to work on a linear system that's exponentially large. So we'd have to do exponential work, but then the reduction doesn't work because things are not efficient, okay? Any questions? I mean, I, so you're basically saying that the paper is wrong? No, I don't want to say that. So um, the, <laughs> I would never say that about a colleague. So what they prove is not this point, but the point nearby is hard. Okay, not the actual circuit, but the nearby. 
And this would be fine if you could, and this is, okay, that's what they prove. And to prove supremacy, you wanna show a whole neighborhood is hard, but to show a whole neighborhood is hard, you would have to, it's okay to show that this, this point and a big neighborhood around it is hard, that includes, that includes this pink region. You with me? Because if this is hard and this little blue region is large enough to include the supremacy interval, you're good. What I'm saying is that they prove this point is hard and the, the truncation will never let you prove, it's not gonna go anywhere if you wanna prove a robust version, you see? So what I prove is that I prove this, I mean, I'll summarize this point is hard and another small neighborhood around it. I also don't prove the whole thing. You know, this quantum supremacy conjecture which has been open for, uh, I don't know, over 10 years, but they actually prove the problem in a neighborhood of it. They prove a different problem, which is very related, but the neighborhood of it only, only works if you assume you have a non-unitary oracle. That is the O does not take in a real circuit, it takes in a non-unitary, takes non-unitary circuits. So it has a different type of complexity assumption. And that little bit of epsilon prime only goes wrong if you assume that you have a unitary oracle. That is you take in an actual circuit, all right? But their robustness claim is okay as long as you make an extra assumption that you're making a proof with respect to non-unitary circuits. That are very close, but they're non-unitary nevertheless. Does that answer your question? So I don't wanna say it's wrong, it's just they prove a related problem. Good, thanks. And it was my starting point. I mean, I talked to them a lot and I, you know, I mean, I was not a complexity theorist to um, traditionally by any measure, but I got into this problem because Adam was giving a talk at MIT and he said, you know, so quantum supremacy is very delicate in terms of arguments. You have this exponentially small stuff. Then he just chopped off the Taylor series during the talk. And I was like, uh, Adam, would it help you if you didn't have to chop off? He just paused and said, yes. And I was like, okay, great. So maybe if I don't chop off, I can prove the supremacy conjecture. And that's why I got into it. Uh, and you know, they know about this result that we've talked a bunch of times. It's yeah. As far as I'm concerned, everything is good. So today, I will tell you that indeed this point, so today I'm gonna to give you a new path that is not based on Taylor series. It's based on Cayley, hint, hint, as the title suggests. It's based on Cayley path, which I'll define. So I'll give you a path that is unitary everywhere for all theta, zero, one, square root of pi, whatever, pi, 15. It's a unitary path. But the compromise is that we won't have polynomials, we'll have rational functions. Rational functions are ratio of polynomials. But they are of, that's polynomial divided by polynomial. But they're the lowest degree possible rational functions. So these are, I, I don't think you can get an improvement as far as, far as algebraic functions are concerned because the degrees are as low as you can hope. Then we'll prove the average case hardness of this point and I'll prove a neighborhood of it, of this point without any extra assumptions. That is not two to the minus n over poly n, but it's two to the minus n cubed. All right, that's, that's how much robustness we can get out. And some of the technical ingredients are that, you know, I had to prove a total variation distance between hard distribution and these deformations under um, Cayley function, which is, which requires some random matrix theory, et cetera. And, for the reduction to work, there is a classical algorithm called Berlick and Welch, which is really remarkable um, in coding theory. I have to generalize it from polynomials to rational functions, uh, but let me tell you quickly what Berlick and Welch does. It's amazing in that, suppose you have a polynomial of whatever, degree D, and you give it so many points, I don't know, N points. And out of the N points, some of the points are totally wrong. So T, there are T errors. So it's like you give it a theta I, the P of theta I has nothing to do with the problem. It's really that off, not even close. But the other points are exactly correct. So you're handed these two poles, a theta I, P of theta I, and only, you know, there's some rate of error. T of them are wrong, the other ones are right. 
And you don't even know which one is which, right? Because if you knew which one is which, you would just throw them out, the garbage ones you would throw out. But what is amazing about Berlick and Welch is that it can nevertheless give you the polynomial exactly. I find it amazing. And the proof is simple. It's, it's basically error correction property. So you encode the messages in the coefficients of a polynomial. And if some of them are wrong, it can still recover the polynomial. So I have to generalize this to rational functions because, you know, I deal with rational functions. All right, guys, I want to tell you about the work. Any questions about the background and the summary? Just, just very quick question. So this epsilon is a for sampling, uh, sampling error for, for random search, for random circuits? This, is, this epsilon is just an additive error for probability amplitudes, which you can translate to a multiplicative error, um, which you can then translate into a total variation distance. But this is just saying that the additive error approximation, so if I can prove that the additive error approximation of this point to within two to the minus n over poly n is hard, then I'm done. You know, you can retrace things that show that sampling is hard. But what we can show is that, you know, only, only this much, the neighborhood we can prove is just as much. Okay. All right, so any other questions? Okay, the Cayley function is this really nice function. F of x is one plus ix over one minus ix. By the way, I did a blog post on this in case you're interested on not supremacy, but just Cayley functions and unitary paths, et cetera. Um, but I'm gonna tell you now. So it's F of x equals this, and you define F of minus infinity, since infinity is not a number, it's not a real number, you define it to be minus one. What is amazing is that you grab the real line, any real point, under F gets mapped uniquely to a point on the unit circle in the complex plane. And it's actually a bijection. So any unique point here uniquely corresponds to an X here. So with that, if I have any Hermitian operator or Hermitian matrix whose eigenvalues are real and I apply the Cayley function to it, I will get a unitary. And the proof is that, you know, Hermitian matrices, what you do to them, you do to their eigenvalues. Not like in vectors. It's actually true with any normal matrix. And it's not hard to see of minus h is h dagger, the 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 the, the inverse of this unitary. And the procedure, oh um, yeah, good. The procedure is that you have this sharply hard circuit, so you want to see m, you generate m corresponding random gates, you publish them, you fix them, and you challenge the world to simulate, you know, CI times HI classically. All right, so under the Cayley deformation, every one of the gates, eight sub Ks, I just did a spectral decomposition here. It's just the eigenvalues times the eigenvectors. And the path that I propose is the following. So you grab the worst case gate, the four by four, two by two gate, multiply by the corresponding R, multiply by F of minus theta HK. At theta, think of theta very small. Remember at zero, F of zero is just one. So you have sharp, you have uh, random. And at theta equals one, you have F of minus H, which I told you before is just HK dagger. So the two endpoints are okay. And if you shove in the, I mean, you do the algebra, you see that this is the only matrix part, the sharpie hard, uh, gate times the eigenvectors, P and Q are just polynomials, in values of each plate. So P alpha is just this, sorry, Q, alpha, which is the same for every entry of CK, and P of alpha is this function. Both are polynomials of degree capital N, which I remind you is two or four. It's hard to imagine any path that would have a lower dependence to on in terms of degree. I mean, there are n eigenvalues, right? And n eigenvectors. So, I mean, degree n is as low as you can hope for. So every one of the little gates has uh, entries that are rational 
functions of type n n, numerator is polynomial of degree n, denominator is polynomial of degree n. So this is probably the most technical slide, but I just wanted to show you the um, form of the function. And so the proposed path is indeed this, right? This is the Cayley path. That's what I'm proposing we do. You grab every one of the gates and you do this deformation. And note that you have unitary times unitary times unitary. So everybody is unitary. Products of unitaries is unitary. At theta equals zero, f of zero is just identity, so you have CKHK. At theta equals one, you have HKHK dagger, so you just have CK. And the path everywhere is unitary. And we do this respecting the architecture. So you do this to every one of the gates. And if you do that and you have M, it's well, the rational functions, the way they're formed is that the total degree for the whole circuit will be little m times n. So like four times the number of gates at most. So the probability amplitude is by definition this. This is the one one entry of this gigantic matrix, which is degree mn, and you take the modulus squared. So p0 of theta is a rational function of degree 2mn, 2mn. Any questions about this construction? So we have to interpolate a rational function. And I'm basically done. I mean, um, some technical ingredients need to go in. One was that, you know, there's that in the reduction, there was this class algorithm O that takes in the description of the circuit and gives you the probability amplitude near zero. I have to prove that that class algorithm succeeds on not polynomials, but rational functions. The reason you need Berlick and Welsh is that if, I, if, I, if my algorithm succeeds on every instance of a random uh, um, circuit you give it, then that's a contradiction because what if randomly with a very low probability you actually give it a Sharpie hard circuit? So you really need to assume that your algorithm succeeds with high enough probability. So this was extended from polynomials to rational functions. I mean, it's technical. I'm not gonna show you the proof. Another thing you need to show is that under these deformations, near theta equals zero, the circuit is very close to hard distributed in total variation distance. That is indeed, you know, like your distribution is practically hard. And, and that's, that's, that's probably, that's one of the more technical parts of any such result. And we prove, I proved that every one of the gates is squared with a theta away. And by additivity of total variation distance, you have O of M times square root of theta. M is the number of gates. And that proves us, to, well, this along with other things, prove the theorem that let A be an architect architecture such that computing P0 is in the worst case Sharpie hard, then it is indeed Sharpie hard to compute most probabilities for circuits with the same architecture but random gates. And this three quarter is a red herring. It could be improved to like 15, 16th or whatever. Now in terms of robustness, a little bit of epsilon, the way it works is that, so instead of having polynomials that have rational functions with some error, and you can just shove it in. I have to prove some stuff, like the denominators don't get too small, so there's some technicalities. But you prove a theorem and it shows that you can actually calculate these probabilities to two to the minus, big theta means it scales as, so it's proportional to. M delta inverse. This delta is quantifiable. It's like something you can really work out. So I don't use this like complexity theoretical language of you know x poly n etc. You work it out the numbers, like you theoretical physicists would do. You work out the numbers. And if you plug in for the actual circuits that we have for constant depth circuits, like Terhal de Vincenzo gives you two to the minus n cubed, and for Google type circuits where the depth is root n you get two to the minus n nine halves, all right? And it would be great if this cubed was one, but actually, to, to prove the supremacy conjecture, but actually, I don't believe the supremacy conjecture is even true for constant depth circuits anymore, despite the claims that were made. I, I don't believe it's true. 
Uh, part of it is numerical evidence. Um, part of it is just intuition. So you can look at this paper, for example. It identifies some constant depth circuits that are universal, nevertheless, on average case, are easy to, easy to sample from. Mostly numerical, but good numerical. Other problems that I'd be interested in to investigate are, you know, can you do quantum computing by interpolation? So suppose like, you know, I'm IBM and you want to run your financial task on my quantum computer because they're too expensive to buy and keep at your home. But you know, you want to send your circuit to me, but you don't want to reveal your quantum computation. You want to send me something that looks random. So maybe you can deform the circuit using my Kelly path, send me something random, and based on the answers I give you, you can put them together in a way to uh, answer you know, your finance problem and make a billion dollars right, on a quantum computer. And related to that are problems about garbling um, local gates like cryptography and circuit hiding. So you want to hide your computation, yet ne nevertheless be able to perform a quantum computation on a server. The k path seems to me to be somewhat optimal in that the degrees are as low as it gets which makes you think that, you know, maybe it's not possible to prove supremacy, even if it were true, using interpolation. So perhaps some other mechanism besides just polynomial interpolation needs to be used to make such claims. There are other interesting problems such as, you know, complexity of surrogates as a function of their randomness, their entanglement content, et cetera, which I won't have time to get into. So let me just salute you for your interest and take any other questions you might have. I had fun. I hope it made sense. Thank you very much, Hermes, for, for Thank you. the talk. Um, I so, hope it wasn't too fast, but you know, you can't ask your questions. We have time. Yeah, I think I think uh, now now the time for questions. So if anybody have anybody has questions, please please ask. Uh, I have a quick question. I mean, it's it, it's maybe not that important, but I'm just curious. Um, you said that this there like a there was sort of a geometric interpretation to um, the Bulland result with the uh, the e to the minus i theta. It's like a geodesic. Um, oh right. Is the k well, like is there a geometric interpretation to the Cayley path that you take, or yeah. is there something? Is it more or less complicated, or not a good interpretation? I don't know. So, uh, that's that's a very good question. I briefly thought about it. The short answer is that I don't know. But the geodesic is the exponential function. The truncation does not have a good geometric, I mean, it leaves the unitary group. Right. Um, but the geodesic is that exponential function. Indeed, it is a geodesic. The Cayley path is geometry, you know, to use a tautology, the Cayley geometry. And I can tell you, so, so I don't know, but the, what I can tell you is the following. I mean, maybe I can even do a numerical simulation for you maybe it's a bad starting map lab right now would not be a good idea. So suppose I started from x equals minus infinity and ran to x to plus infinity, all right? So I, I went from x to minus infinity and at every unit of time, so you know, grab the infinite line, chop it into like little intervals and at every unit of time, equidistant, I put a dot. So as I go here, I use that x and I put a dot here. You understand? So like if x is zero, that corresponds to this rightmost point. Um, so what happens, so at minus infinity, you start here, at minus one, then you spend infinite amount of time, basically, near minus infinity, and then you get a lot of points really fast. So theta equals zero, x equals zero is here. You get a lot of points really fast, then you spend equal amount of infinite time to go back to this point. So basically you grab the real line. I don't know if you can see my hand, but like you grab the real line, you bend it, identify the two infinities at minus one and they're infinite points near infinity and most finite points are gonna be here on this side. So you have a fast speed here and very slow speed here. This is as much as geometry as I can tell you on the eigenvalues, eigenvalue transformations of, uh, of the gates. Awesome, thank you. It's also, if you look at my blog, I do the simulation there. You can see, you can, you can see how you spend infinite time near minus one. <laughs> I, do, I go from minus 40 to plus 40 because infinity would have taken me a while. But uh, 
you get the idea if you look at it. Thanks, Adam. What was, uh, any other questions? Uh, I have a question, but you can go ahead first on this. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, I'll just introduce if anybody else has a question. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, is there a good way of understanding where the N cube comes from? Oh. Um, improving that would prove the supremacy conjecture, right? Yeah, it comes from the theorem. Um, here. Yeah. So M is the number of gates, which is, you know, N to a three halves because I have say root N, root N. Okay, N cubed you said. So I have root N, root N times O1. So there's already N here. Yeah. And so there's an N that comes from here. The del N over N squared because I would need that for the interpolation to land in that region that is here. I would need, I would require that this delta to be sufficiently small such mm -hmm. that, you know, things work out. So this and as lo the, the largest delta I can take is indeed uh, one over n squared. And that comes from Pateri's lemma? That comes from the form of the rational functions you have based on Cayley, proving that the denominators are not too small, they're actually larger than one. Okay. And um, bounding these things, and then, because Paturi is just for polynomials, it's not for rational functions. Mm -hmm. And then reducing a problem to something that's effectively polynomial and using Paturi. Okay. I, I really hope to post the version two of the paper soon where things are explained clearer. The version one is, um, I mean, everything is kind of there, but uh, maybe the language was, you know, coming from a different field maybe i didn't express things in the best language so it's clearest way but hopefully in version two will be clear okay. uh, any other questions so maybe i ask i'll ask a question uh, sure question is, so the first question is maybe, um, so all, all the bound for um, epsilon D as a generic circuit, so is there any, are there any uh, assumption about circuits uh, involved to this estimates of epsilon? So what if I have um, a real diluted circuit, uh, for example? Uh, so, so these circuits are um, the, I mean, the epsilon, so look, so these circuits are sparse because they're local, okay? The, the epsilon that you have, um, sorry, I don't really understand your question. Maybe, maybe ask it again. Uh, I, no, I, my, I my question is, uh, yeah, so, so question is, um, all, all this uh, epsilon bounds, what are assumptions mm -hmm. on circuits you use to get the bounds? Uh -huh, I see. So you mean locality? like these epsilons, such, I mean, so my circuits are all local. Yes. These epsilons? Both are local in, in number of qubits and in, in uh, space, right? It, it doesn't have to be, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be local. Uh, the locality, I'm just saying local because, you know, to get, to use the parameters that they use in experiments. Uh, it doesn't depend on, the epsilon doesn't depend on circuit as far as I, the epsilon depends only on on, on these, on the number of gates and uh -huh. what you need to prove that the circuit is close to Har, which comes from the proof of robustness. So, so the only, right, the only so it depends on this. The, the number of circuits, but uh, how they arrange this. Is my understanding right? No, I don't think it depends on
depends on the number of them and no it doesn't depend on locality It depends on the size of the each one of the gates, which I'm taking to be, you know, two by two or four by four. Okay. Thanks. It's a good thank question. You for, thank you for the question. Sure. So it depends. It depends on the depth, as you can see, right? Like depth, and number of qubits, and the number of gates. Yeah. Thank you. Does anybody have any more questions? Okay, uh, then I would like to thank Ramis for the nice talk. Uh, very nice to hear about this new result. And um, if anybody uh, has any additional questions, I guess uh, uh, they yep. can contact Ramis by email. And That's right. Always happy to talk. Thanks. This was fun. Great. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.